All right, so I'm just going to be presenting a little bit before our first team presents. So welcome everybody. I know we are still one minute early, but um, I'm just going to introduce everything in the meantime while we wait for any other people to arrive. So welcome to the top 10 presentations of the International Youth Brainstem Summit. And we are really glad to have you all here today. As I mentioned previously, this will be three hours of presentations and it was very difficult picking the winning teams of the top 10. We actually had over 600 participants from 42 countries and there were over 120 eligible team project submissions. So that's why we took a little bit more time yesterday to decide because we wanted to make sure that the teams that were selected had quality presentations and work regardless of any potential biases based on category or judges. Okay. Yeah, I can um, introduce the judges that will be judging the um, top 10 presentations today. Our first judge is Dr. Caroline Johnson, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California in Los Angeles, who has also worked at the University of Southern California. She has extensive expertise in neuroscience education as well as neuroscience research. We other judges include Sagar um, Satravedi, um, as well as uh, Vanshika Singh. So those will be some of your judges today and good luck to all the top 10 presentations. So first up, we will have Team Glia Low Files presenting right now, and they will be part of the 18 to 22 age category. So would one of the team members be able to start sharing their screens and sending up their presentation? Well, I think we're good. You can begin and the seven minute timer will begin now. Okay, so good morning. We are team Glealophiles with me, Ankush, Anushree, Arkadeep, and Leafy. Next. And today we'll be uh, talking in the challenge area of research in the frontier of neurological disorders. And the subject would be treatment resistant depression. Next. So what is depression? Depression is characterized by low mood for a long period of time. And as WHO estimates, around 322 million people suffer from depression. To put that into context, it's around 20 times the number of people affected by Corona at this point. So it's huge. Next. So how do we know a person has depression? Well, we give them this questionnaire to fill up and based on the scores that we get, say zero to seven says no depression, mild depression would be eight to 16, moderate depression would be 17 to 23, and severe depression is greater than 24. So this is not really a test where we want to score very high, you know, next. So what are the treatments? Well, there are psychiatric therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy. And there are antidepressant therapy where you just pop in an antidepressant and wait for things to get better. Next. So Leafy will take over from here. Over to you, Leafy. Right. So there are some depressions which do not respond to two or more sessions of these conventional treatments and are known as tre treatment resistant depression. So to handle these problems, there are a few methods like electrophysiological method and a pharmacological method. In electrophysiological method, electrical devices are used to suppress certain regions of brain uh, to reduce the hyperactivity. For example, we have RTMS, that is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, BNS, that is vagus nerve stimulator, and ECD, that is uh, electroshock therapies. Uh, in pharmacological methods, we have uh, psilocybin, that is uh, a naturally derived uh, psychedelic. Uh, though a lot of research is not done on this particular drug, but uh, uh, whatever we know uh, till now is uh, pretty reliable to reverse the conditions of mm, the depression. And we can also use a combination of anti-inflammatory drugs with antidepressants, where anti-inflammatory drug would reduce the inflammation in different parts of the brain. Next slide. And uh, the problem with the current solutions is that on an average, in a long term, they have very low success rate. 
And yes, we can say that depression is very unique for everyone, which is why we think that the existing techniques uh, are not very consistent. Uh, from here, Arkadeep would continue with the slides. Okay, uh, so we have a problem here, and the problem is the lower success rates of the current TRD treatment. And for that, we propose a hypothetical solution. And the solution is uh, using sequential screening tests to generate the personalized treatment for the individual. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we are uh, proposing a two approaches. One is the pharmacological approach, and the other is the electrophysiological approach. So in the electrophysiological, uh, uh, this is we are basically detecting the brain waves by EEG, and depressed patient, the brain waves of the patient is currently disrupted because the individual neurons activity will be much higher than the normal resting state of the normal individual. Then in the pharmacological approach, we are uh, detecting the cytokines, and cytokines are basically responsible for impaired neurogenesis and depressed brain, also the uh, decrease in the serotonin level, which is a major depressive change, in the, which may change the depressed uh, brain. So yeah, we, these are the two techniques we are uh, proposing, and from here, Anushri will take over. Okay, so like my teammates rightly mentioned, the available treatments for treatment-resistant depression involves an experimental design that treats patients irrespective of the specific problem that plagues them. So this could be the very reason that results are not consistent. So in our hypothetical experiment, we have proposed the inclusion of several screening tests for treatment-resistant depression patients, that is those who don't respond to two or more trials of any kind of conventional treatment that we have elucidated for you in the previous slides. So based on these screening tests, we can divide patients into cohorts. We suggest the use of quantitative EEG scans to detect any sort of electrophysiological hyperactivity that is more, of, more often than not associated with depression. So this cohort of patients can then undergo treatments involving RTMS, VNS, or ECT in order to quieten down those brain areas. Secondly, we propose the use of inflammatory cytokine tests to detect the presence of neural inflammation. So there is increasing evidence from studies that the presence of uh, inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 or IL-6 leads to increased serotonin reuptake, which inhibits the class of antidepressants called SSRIs from doing their job. And this leads to TRD, that is treatment-resistant depression. So this cohort of patients can undergo treatments involving a combination of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, and antidepressant drugs, which is also already known to be a very effective solution. So we advocate the fact that there is no one size fits all sort of cure for depression because it is an experience that is unique to every patient that goes through it. And continuing randomized or generic approaches uh, to solve this is a lost cause. So we propose a targeted and more personalized experimental protocol that can be adopted feasibly because it does not need any new technological intervention or any novel therapies. And knowing that 322 million people in the world are affected with depression, and around 30% of these suffer from treatment-resistant depression, taking our proposed approach would impact at least 96 million of them. And in the war against depression, we believe that this is a very strong start. So uh, with that, we come to the end. This is the literature that supports our presentation. And uh, we are open to any questions that you might have. Thank you. I just have three minutes to ask questions now. Uh, hi, Anushree. Uh, thanks hi. for the presentation. Uh, one question that I had is uh, one of the prototypes that you suggest, the QEEG. Uh, yeah. So one thing that we know about depression is like, like you yourself said, that there's no one size fits all, right? And when we look right. at brain scans, uh, we get to not have a template, so to say, uh, you know, by which we can compare, uh, you know, different scans and say, well, this brain or scan looks depressed or you know has some certain aspects of depression showing uh, in that particular scan or not. So could you just elaborate on how you want to take this forward, especially the QEEG prototype that you just suggested? Okay, so let me go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. So see here, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is uh, from a paper where there was a comparative study between control patients and major depressive disorder patients. So you can find out that there is an increased uh, activity in uh, brain areas 
um, in case of major depressive uh, disorder patients when compared to the control ones. So I know there's no template that you can uh, compare uh, that this person has depression and uh, this is how it should be, but um, it would always help to have a number of uh, studies in this, uh, so in, in, our, in our approach, so that we would have, you know, more, uh, like you said, we would generate more templates uh, for such kind of studies to be uh, successful in the future. So this is a very primitive uh, uh, research that is going on right now. All the papers that we have uh, referred to are like in the, just, just the past five years, you see. So, um, uh, and the fact that this is new and this is upcoming and this is successful, might be successful, is really hopeful for uh, treatment resistant depression patients. Yeah, just I a line think. of thread that you guys can think over. Uh, so when you mention that in these scans, the brain areas have a higher activity, you might just want to check that because in EEG, it's basically uh, you're more looking at the temporal activity of the brain rather than the spatial activity. So uh, it's yeah. difficult, uh, you know, to pinpoint uh, the spatial resolution in EEG scan. So you might just want to polish. Yeah, we will. Uh, so we might will I add in, uh, in this? So, uh, yeah, so uh, in certain studies, what we have found out is certain brain regions tend to be more active in the resting state. So if you look at this picture on the left, the theta waves and the delta waves of the EEG tend to be uh, active at certain regions, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and uh, certain other regions such as pondosteriatal regions. So what yeah. happens is in depressed patients, uh, there's uh, more activity in the resting state. So say uh, we are sleeping or we are just resting. In that case, when we compare patients uh, with the control, what we see is certain regions tend to be more active even when they're supposed to be doing nothing. So based on that, what we can see is, so if you uh, compare the two brain scans, you can understand how different they are. So the activity in the MDD patients, or the overall activity is uh, a lot more. If you look at the colors, you can understand how different they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and uh, another, uh, another thing that you can also consider is looking at the default mode network, uh, which is very highly implicated in yeah. uh, depressed patients. So that's also one aspect that you can definitely think about. Yeah, so that's the thing that's uh, being tried, you know, is being treated with uh, drugs like psilocybin, which are known to, uh, no, you know, block the depressed mode networks, I'm sorry, default mode networks. <laughs> so uh, uh, they are kind of a different approach. We believe that certain brain regions tend to, so uh, the vagus nerve is, uh, said to be more active in certain depressed brains, which is why VNS tends to work. What VNS does is basically suppress those certain brain regions. Most of these uh, uh, magnetic approaches of treating depression, what they do is they create epileptic seizures at, in certain parts of the brain and thus stop the brain activity in those certain regions, right? So we believe that due to the hyperactivity, it might be a disabling factor and thus the treatments with magnetic therapies work. Does it answer your question? Yeah, sure. I think the other judges can take over the question since we have a possible of here. Yeah, hi, yeah. I just have one question for you. Uh, first of all, a very good work. Um, it is, you know, uh, really, yeah. So I just have one question again, uh, uh, Ms. Vanshika, that uh, she was talking about. Uh, I uh, studied EG for quite a while and was not able to find that much reliable data. And I totally agree that you were also saying uh, there is not such template for now. <clears throat> but yeah. what? Uh, so uh, what I recommend, just a recommendation, if you know, if yeah. you uh, you are not you know um, um, able to get the particular template, and after that, after you know getting this solution to uh, implementation. I recommend to remove EEG because, you know, it will also cut down the costs, costs for the individuals and the patient. And you mm -hmm. can just go directly to um, the, 
the TMS or TMS with the BMS photo. So if it is uh, just go through it, if only it you know it has a success rate of eighty percent of above or above, if it you know goes below eighty percent, then I recommend to remove it from the process. Well, right, that's right. true, but then uh, uh, so the treatment uh, techniques that already exist have lower success rates than sixty percent. So uh, yeah. So uh, I'm saying in the terms of in the terms of uh, the activity that you know the effectivity that they already produce in terms of ethically correct and the solutions that they already produce. Yeah. So we probably need a lot more data to make something of a kind of a template to understand uh, it better. But then uh, we can just uh, throw educated guesses at. How we can understand this at this point of time with the given data? That's what I'm saying. That that's that totally makes sense. That way. Yeah. And I also want to know your um, opinion on the DBS, the deep brain stimulation technique for the depression treatment. So what are you? Uh, it works well, yes. But then the problem is it's invasive. So that's a huge problem in case of patients who are not very physically stable. In older patients, so. uh it would be tough and even with patients who have other diseases that might be very problematic when you are doing a surgery so keeping all of those in mind it is kind of tough uh using uh, dbs we know because uh, a lot of uh, people with parkinsons have been implanted with dbs and uh, thus we can uh, use it on them without really having much of a problem because it's needed for them but then uh, implant implementing it on normal people normal cohort of people would be a bit tough because it requires surgery right and um, yeah, yeah, more, totally, i think yeah, i'm not wrong, sorry for interrupting but if i'm not please, wrong please, please um uh, dbs is mostly used for treating a motor symptoms uh, as in the especially in parkinsons the the tremors and the the uh, you know shaking and stuff that happens deep brain stimulation is known to uh, um uh, lower those symptoms but i'm i'm not sure if there's enough literature supporting the fact that it uh, uh, affects there there uh, is actually but yeah i mean it all all of the work is still in quite an experimental it's in, stage it's in the honest. pipeline that's the problem yes yes i totally agree. so uh, we can also give an approach for the depression also because uh, i've seen two or three studies that have been found to be successful on depression and uh, uh, anxiety and uh, hyperactivity too. so mm -hmm. there was some dbs right that is dbs yes dbs but on specific group the person as you said should not have any the person should not have any you know diabetic or parkinson yeah. whatever you talking about yeah. it's a specific group and a specific age And uh, um, you should be healthy and all. And the success rate was approximately about ninety percent. So I guess that can be a try. But again, it totally depends on how these things go. Right. Yes. That's all the time we have. Questions. Uh, we'll be taking yeah. a few questions from the audience now. So I think uh, John, I am. You have a question. You can unmute your mic and you can ask your question if you want. Okay um thank you so much uh the group it was um really wonderful and an amazing present an amazing and well coordinated presentation um the problem i think the problem with dbs that's the brain stimulation apart from being it been very invasive there are lots of ethical issues to it because um yeah. there was a time i i was supposed to go for um Uh, a brain symposium, and it was about optogenetics, DBS, and someone mm -hmm. wrote to me from US. Come on, ne um, neuroscientist, haven't you found other techniques that can be used aside DBS? Because I wouldn't want probes to be on my brain. So I, I laughed. <laughs> I, I just laughed at that. Um, so I'm particularly interested about um, the neuroinflammatory axis because you proposed the QEEG. and the neuroinflammatory using the pro-inflammatory cytokines and i believe that okay. there are specific rules that antioxidants please when it comes to depression antioxidants mm -hmm. antioxidants there are rules they play in depression because there have been lots and lots of success stories from antioxidants especially those the powerful okay. antioxidants from plants i don't know if you can tell us 
from your uh, literature search some of the roles that this anxious student has to play, especially in cases of um, um, uh, neuroinflammation, microglial activities, uh, astrocyte activities, and even yeah. to, uh, to the neurons. Thank you. So, so um, pro-inflammatory okay. uh, uh, cytokines usually lead to increase in reactive oxygen species in the brain. So that's that's uh, known to be the effect of inflama inflammation. So, uh, like you said, antioxidants are a strong, um, um, you know, protection against them because they protect uh, damage caused by any uh, any of these reactive oxygen species. So yes, including antioxidants uh, in the uh, in the therapy or in the diet through the diet would actually help in um, reducing these uh, the damage caused due to the inflammatory cytokines. So, would you want me to go any further? Uh, How does that answer your question? That's all the time we have for now. Um, okay. Are the judges? Um, would the judges like to ask anything else, or do you think, or is are all the judges good with what they've asked already? I have yeah, one I quick question that's kind yeah. of outside of the scope, maybe of the direct science. Um, <clears throat> what do you think the the accessibility of this kind of treatment is? You know, a lot of people uh, maybe don't have access to doctors, don't have access to the kind of high tech equipment. How do you propose kind of rolling this out to make it? more accessible to a wider audience? Well, to be honest, uh, these tests have costs. And uh, in fact, all the treatments currently being used in treatment resistant depression also have costs. And certain uh, ones like psilocybin, uh, which are naturally occurring uh, plant substances, are not are moderated by governments all over the world. So there's not really a way you can uh, use it on everyone without a uh, cost, to be honest. Uh, but if we compare it with the antidepressant treatments, which go on for a long period of time and cost a lot every month, if we can deal with the problem uh, at the base so that we can identify what the problem is and treat exactly what the problem is, we believe that perhaps we might be cost effective in the long run. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Thank you. That was a good answer. Thank you. Quickly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you may begin now. Hello, my name is Anika Kashyap, and I'm here with my teammates, Andre Mitrofan and Celine Nguyen. We are all rising sophomores at Rice University doing the ethics prompt and free will as our subtopic. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, we chose neuroethics because neuroscience really has implications in human self-understanding, ethics, and policy. We really tried to combine all of these when coming up with our problem and our solution. And to define free will a little bit for you, it is the ability to act at one's own discretion. So for us, it's a lot about decision making. First, we will discuss the problem, then our proposed solution, or the Spears Act, and results from our survey. Finally, we will discuss feasibility impact, and lastly, our conclusion. So we're focusing on mental incapacity, legal incompetence, and guardianship. Legal incompetence is when the court finds an individual unable to make legal and financial decisions. Medical incapacity is when a medical doctor provides an opinion on this decision or decides that a patient cannot make their own medical decisions. When an individual is declared incompetent, patients are rarely reassessed, and restoration of rights proceedings are rarely ever used. And standardization is also an issue during said reassessment. Physicians were successful in determining capacity, but only determined incapacity of 42% of the true cases. And they mainly used qualitative measures to determine this. The Texas Office of Court Administration reviewed over 27,000 guardianship cases, out of which nearly 64% were recommended for closure. Moreover, the project found numerous instances of unauthorized and unjustified expenses and withdrawals from accounts, indicating the current problem of guardians potentially taking advantage of the words free will and material possessions. The following are three case studies where individuals were placed under guardianship due to being deemed legally incompetent or medically incapacitated. All three had to petition the court against their guardian to be granted independence, and specifically in the case of In Ray Maxwell, clinical records were used. 
All three cases emphasize the need for reassessment for mental capacity. A lot of what is currently in use is qualitative in a patient's ability to communicate a choice, mainly about decision making. Many physicians mistakenly view refusing treatment as a sign of mental incapacity, but studies in the 80s show that it was proven that uh, show that this was mainly due to physician patient interactions, bad patient physician interactions. And what is currently in use for determining legal incompetence is the MMSE, but a study in the journal JAMA underscores how this is only really useful in particularly extreme cases. There are, however, alternate assessments that can be used that as standardization, such as the ACE or HCAT test. In a 2011 review in the JAMA journal, it was stated that the HCAT was even considered to have a near 100% accuracy by three separate studies. The solution we propose is the SPEARS Act, Statute for Physician Engagement in Accurately Reassessing Status. Although medical examinations are part of the initial court proceedings for instating guardianship, personal care providers, PCPs, normally don't have any role in the assessment or monitoring of the individual. First of all, we suggest that PCPs need to be notified of an individual's incompetence and provided with accurate tests for decision-making abilities in order to be able to perform the assessment of the individual. Moreover, the physician performing the reassessment has to provide a medical certificate that can be added to the court file. Having the physician certificate be reviewed alongside the guardian's annual assessment would aid the process of an individual petitioning for restoration of rights by having objective evidence of recovery of competence. Our second proposal is for more frequent evaluation of an individual's legal incompetence, either yearly or bi-yearly. With today's progress in therapeutic methods, there is increasing evidence that mental capacity can be recovered and therefore guardianship could be revoked. It is essentially important for reassessments to occur within the first two years after the legal decision, as that's when most of the successful guardianship cases have been resolved. If no reassessment occurs within two, the first two years, the court is obligated to re-examine the individual through a mental health specialist on site. For cases of individuals with progressive degenerative diseases, where recovery is less likely, we propose an initial reassessment within two years, and another one within five years. If there are no signs of competence recovery with, after this period, the word must petition the court through the process currently in place. We conducted a survey to evaluate the consumptions of mental health diagnosis in regards to our topic. Our sample size was 42. As you can see, an overwhelming 95% of respondents believe a state of medical incapacitation or legal incompetence can change. In this next graph, over 80% of respondents believe that those individuals should be reassessed at least once every year. And finally, the graph on the left shows that 74% feel confident that a PCP would be able to conduct this reassessment if they are using a standardized testing procedure. These surveys and our 42 particip participants show the impact that this solution would have on the target population of individuals 40 to 65 years old. It increases patient confidence as more individuals trust a primary care provider using a standardized procedure. And many of these individuals believe it is necessary for capacity to be reevaluated. In the United States alone, there are 1.3 million open cases of guardianship and many people are being exploited and stripped of their free will. This is not just a necessary solution, but a feasible one too. There is legal precedent for reassessment and restoration of rights as seen by the case studies before, as well as Senate and state reports that highlight issues within the system, as we have previously discussed. And cost is not as big of an issue as it may seem. In the United States, with the passage of the Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act of 2017, the federal government is required to provide state grants only for guardianship cases. Guardians are already required to submit a report on their ward, but 43% of these guardians' reports are out of compliance. Our solution will improve the accuracy of this procedure, and the tests that we've proposed are already in use, just not standardized. As of today, there are over 1.3 million active guardianship cases in the U.S., indicating a large number of individuals currently affected. Whereas most people recognize that cognitive function is dynamic and can also change towards the better over time, the current legal system does not represent the fluid nature of cognitive competence. The government and Senate have already identified the issues with current guardianship proceedings, passing the Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act, and the issue has recently come to the general media's attention through pop culture, mainly with the hashtag Free Britney movement and with the current Kanye West mental health controversy. This is both a legal and a moral issue, and change is needed and desired. We propose the Spears Act aiming to stop individuals under guardianship from having their free will and material belongings taken advantage of. By requiring mandatory reassessment and standardization of testing for mental capacitance, 
we believe we could ease the process of wards petitioning for and obtaining restoration of rights. Thank you all for your attention, and I would like to now open the floor to questions. The judges now have three minutes to ask any questions. Um, may I begin by saying that this problem was very well identified, very well elaborated on, and very well thought of. And I congratulate you guys for putting in so much thought and effort. Um, I would just also begin by saying that it also helps to think exactly what are these neurotypicals, uh, you know, that we look at uh, when we say that uh, an ex person is uh, mentally competent to take all these legal decisions or any decision for that matter, and who are not, right? So this is a very subjective sort of uh, deliberation that's open to the field of neuroscience and particularly to free will and ethics and neuroethics. Uh, so one question that maybe I can um, throw to you guys is um, while I was listening to you guys, I I had this concern whether putting a lot of power in a PCP or a, a primary care physician to be taking uh, a very centralized kind of decision in, in the guardianship of, uh, of a certain people, uh, how would you address the ethics of that uh, if, if, if all that power rests in one particular uh, domain of, of profession? Uh, could you, could you uh, think about expanding that to more such parallel professions or a more such parallel uh, set of people? That's uh, that's my question to you guys. So, yeah. so currently, as of now, um, the original assessment is usually conducted by a mental, mental health specialist. The only issue that we're trying to show is that these that these are never later reassessed. They don't show that later yeah. on this mental capacity has changed. So a lot of people don't usually go to mental health specialists on a regular basis. And so as a result, they all usually, a lot of people have primary care providers, or even if they don't, we have suggested that the court provide a mental health specialist on site after two years. But it is mainly the primary care providers um, certificate that just shows that this is, this individual is no longer incompetent as a suggestion to the court and then can be later evaluated. It is only to provide uh, more evidence if an individual decides to say that they, they appeal their case, that they are no longer incompetent, that they want their rights back. Right. Perfect. Thank you. Any other judges have questions? We have about one minute left for judging questions. Yeah, I didn't have any questions. <clears throat> just I, I just want to congratulate all of you to take such an important topic uh, because, you know, uh, neuroethics ethics is something that is, you know, in a very intensive, you can say, you know, uh, from the last year itself, when the Ibro International Brain Research Organization started um, a neuroethics section after their every school, they conduct APRC or ARC, whatever. It is. So it's just a, a very... Uh, I just pass my congratulations to you and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, do you have any questions for this for this team? No, I actually don't. I think it was really, really well explained. Okay. Thanks to all the judges. Do any audience members have questions now while the next team gets set up? Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask your question if you would like. Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you, Team Spears. We enjoyed your presentation. And we'll move on to the next team now. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, next we have Team Light Flight, which is Sanjana Guram, Aryan Kandi, and Tyson Swanisavan. It will be beginning at 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time. If the judges are done, um, we'd like to welcome Team Light Flight, uh, Sanjana Guram, Aryan Kandi, and Tyson Swanisavan to begin their presentation. Yes, yes. Time begins now. Hello, thank you for sharing your time with us today. I'm Sanjana. I'm Maureen. And I'm Tyson, and we are Team Light Flight. New fun, new friends, sleepless nights, and sleepy days. As professionals and frequent commuters, you've likely experienced the fatigue of crossing time zones, and way too often of that. This phenomenon is what we refer to as jet lag. By crossing into another time zone in a short period of time, you disrupt your body's circadian rhythm. Aside from the sheer inconvenience, jet lag holds considerable adverse effects. The American Sleep Association reported that more than nine out of 10 travel travelers suffer from jet lag. Its effects vary from person to person, 
but the average traveler suffers from a few adverse effects, ranging from general discomfort to long-term insomnia, a stressed amygdala, dementia, to temporal lobe atrophy. And because of the change in external stimuli, the molecular oscillations pertaining to the suprachiasmatic nucleus are desynchronized, which in turn throws off the circadian rhythm. The first diagram illustrates the connectivity of the ganglia thalmocortical circuit. Using a two-sample t-test, there was significant evidence that it had less robust regions and was impaired due to jet lag. The bottom diagram shows significantly reduced activity in the hippocampus and bilateral, bilateral inferior temporal gyrus, which processes stimuli. In an attempt to prevent and reduce jet lag, our proposed app, Light Flight, would utilize multiple neurological stimuli to shift the traveler's internal circadian rhythm towards the destination time zone. For example, by making simple dietary suggestions, the app could encourage the production of specific stimulatory hormones by encouraging specific precursor molecules, such as triacine from meat and tryptophan from carbohydrates. By suggesting a calculated lights out time to use an eye mask, the app can promote the secretion of certain neurohormones, such as melatonin, one of the main regulatory hormones of the circadian rhythm. Light flight can even more directly stimulate the production or suppression of neurohormones by automatically providing blue and red light stimulation through the phone screen itself. For example, using the retinal hypothalamic tract, light information will go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and either suppress or stimulate melatonin released from the pineal gland. In the same light, light flight could even calculate the exact time and general dosage suggestion for melatonin supplements to artificially and directly stimulate the circadian rhythm. By combining these treatments into a calculated schedule, we estimate the app to be able to correct the circadian rhythm by as much as seven and a half hours within a six, 18 hour uh, flight period. We've prototyped light flight to make it very accessible and straightforward for travelers. The only input that a user provides is the flight number. Once the flight number is provided, the app will automatically collect necessary information, including time zone changes, as well as departure and landing times. These figures are then inputted into a simple algorithm, which will generate an optimized and easy to follow schedule plan. The schedule frames and so the solutions described previously to specific times. We've implemented self-aid tips, which outline helpful general suggestions that work in tandem with the tailored schedule. We've also diversified the suggestions and their corresponding notifications to better aid families. Here's how the apps works in action. The first screen Light Flight presents to a user is the option to plan a trip. To do so, one only needs to enter the flight number or choose their flight from the drop-down list. From this, the app can pull all the necessary data to, to create a complete recommendation. As a safety precaution, the app will confirm the correct flight path as to not accidentally create an incorrect recommendation. After confirming the proper flight path, Light Flight provides some pre-flight tips that could increase the app's effectiveness. Finally, the user is led to the main page, the schedule. The schedule outlines the entire user's flight plan, including sections which require no user input, such as when the phone's display will be automatically changed. After exiting the timeline, the user is returned to the main menu. From here, the schedule may be viewed at any time, but also all future notifications can be accessed, which are even tailored depending on the user's company. Finally, when the user has declared they have landed, they are left with a few final tips and a proper send-off. Implementing this is quite simple. LifeFlight could administer active preventative measures to minimize or even eliminate the fatigue that has become synonymous to air travel with nothing more than a smartphone. It's therefore usable by the 2.87 billion smartphone users and nearly 4.1 billion annual passengers as reported by the International Air Transport Association in 2018. With its $0 developmental cost and easy to use user interface and travel only increasing due to economic modernization and a great tourist worldview, this app can easily take flight. A Google survey had a random sample size of 35 individuals from across the world, with the sample having an expected 3.2 flights annually. There is an explicit 77% approval rate with 90%, 91% of survey respondents declaring themselves potential users. Through numerous calculations, LifeFlight can predict how much it reduce jet lag. With a theoretical seven and a half hour shift, we could reduce the recovery period of crossing six time zones from the typical six to 10 days to just one to two. It may even be able to eliminate jet lag from shorter flights. 
Should we say bright light? This app has a bright future as a combination of its recommendations can help individuals with other circadian rhythm disorders. For instance, the drug-based treatment using, used for Huntington's disease often causes a circadian misalignment. Using the same theory behind life flight, we may be able to mitigate this issue on a low budget. Another option is even utilizing optogenetics to create a low budget gadget. Thank you for your time. This was Tyson. Aryan. And Sanjana with Team Light Flight. Thank you, Team Light Flight. The judges now have three minutes to ask questions. I have a quick question. Um, first of all, wonderful presentation. Um, secondly, how would you how would you ensure that your users are are only seeing the light that you have provided for them? Like, what if they're in an ambient environment? What if they're somewhere that is non-conducive to um, your treatment? So we've actually taken that into account and Light Flight would, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to completely isolate the user. However, it would give as many tips to create the ideal environment. For example, it would recommend to close the window to your side on the plane if possible, to turn off the overhead lights, um, when you're entering or exiting the airport, if if it's recommended, they would recommend to wear sunglasses to reduce as much ambient light as possible or to seek out bright light to expose yourself to as much bright light as possible. But if the user doesn't follow the suggested recommendations, we can't guarantee or even assume that the treatment will work. Thank you. That was a very thoughtful answer. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a quick question. Um, so uh, you have taken a sample size of 45 participants, right? 45? 35. 35. 35, okay. Um, so uh, the proposal, uh, the, the thing that you proposed that, you know, uh, hypothesis is, uh, uh, you know, uh, circling around the algorithm that you made. And the algorithm is based on those the result from those thirty five participants, right? For that, uh, no, the algorithm was based off of calculations on how much certain treatments and certain inf outside influences can affect an internal circadian rhythm. The survey was actually only to uh, cast the net to find out how many people would possibly w be willing to try out an experimental app like this. So um, uh, just the, uh, can you ask uh, from where the, you got the data for your algorithm proposition? And that? Oh, of course, sorry. The references are here. Uh, we, we went through numerous sources uh, dating all the way from 1999 to I think the latest one was 2020. And within these studies, they um, used the, they, uh, sorry, using the, within these studies, most of the time, the circadian rhythm was calculated by monitoring the average uh, time for the lowest body temperature, which is which is significant, which signifies um, yeah. a marking point for the start of the circadian rhythm. And from there, they analyzed how much of a shift each treatment for which intensity of light and other um, influences affected the circadian rhythm. And from there, we calculated the algorithm. So in the app, you asked for the age group that how old the individual is because it will yeah, be depend on the age really that they're attacking. Uh, yes. So on average, the age groups taken in the references we used were adults, healthy adults. So it ranged from anywhere between 18 to about 40. Um, additionally, our survey respondents were also in a very similar age group as they ranged from our peers to our parents. So it was around 16 to 50. That, that sounds great. And just one last quick question or suggestion, whatever I can say. Um, uh, when you're talking about blue light, because you know blue light is, uh, uh, I can say it is very important in uh, for uh, forwarding the circadian uh, circadian unit, uh, sorry, circadian unit. It is given to the you know Air Force pilots to um, blue light as well as zolpidem in, uh, in, uh, in combination to you know, extend their performance practices uh, during the uh, flight. So with blue light, there is uh, one problem that it can, uh, in, uh, you know, it can uh, initiate epileptic seizures. 
there are some studies on that. So this is just a recommendation that just go through some studies uh, if possible. If uh, you know blue light is involved in um, uh, seizures and it is only effective in a certain age group, for example, 65 to 75. So you, you can just take that into consideration and before you know going through that, you can just ask their age and ask if they have a problem of epileptic seizure. Then you can just provide some of the solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And um, with that being said, the amount of blue light we're using is essentially what ambiently comes from your phone. Um, it may be magnified to a very minor extent, but it will predominantly be of the standard blue light emission from a smartphone. Yeah, that's great. So again, very but of course, we would have a recommendation. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. That, that, that is very important. Yeah. So again, a very yes. good talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is at 11 or at 12 15 p.m. So, if any audience members have questions, uh, we can take them. Or if any judges have even more questions, we can take that as well. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, I see in the chat, Ram has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question, or would you like it to be read out for you? Um, I can read it out. Um, Ram asks, how are you going to be able to make it engaging to look at a blue light? I don't want to stare at a blank screen during my flight. And of course, no one wants to stare at a blank screen. And seeing as the treatment time for a blue light could be up to an hour, of course, no one's going to stare at a screen like that. But rather, the app would only recommend or encourage the use of in-flight apps. And it actually, it's not just a straight uh, blue light screen. Rather, it magnifies the intensity of, of very specific frequencies, which are... Um, overly sensitive in the optical stimulation range. For example, the blue light is um, predominantly um, magnifying the, I think, I believe it was 612 nanometers wavelength. And so that would just passively increase the intensity in the background. So all your normal apps will work fine and it'll just um, recommend for you to stay on your phone for that hour. Yeah, so you could be playing like Candy Crush for all, all we care and it would work exactly the same. Yes. Um, Moshka or Moksha asks privately, can people who use glasses that block blue light use this app? And I've glasses, so we did take that into consideration. And because these glasses block a good spectrum of the upper blue light, the effectiveness would most likely be greatly decreased, but we haven't seen any studies on this. Yeah, and um, since it's working in tandem with a lot of other effects, that would only decrease your uh, phase shift by a little bit because you still have the infrared and you still have the dietary suggestion and the melatonin supplements. So you will still experience a pretty significant phase shift that's desired. And the phase shift is uh, as the circadian rhythm and your biological clock. Yes. Uh, what about phones that use different display levels of brightness? How will you accommodate for that? Um, most likely, we would have a recommended brightness setting for different models of phones after measuring uh, the intensity of each brightness level. Or we could possibly influence it directly by having the app control it itself. Is there any other questions? Do the judges have any questions they would like to add on? I'm good. Dr. Duncan and uh, Ms. Singh, are you, all, are you both good? Yeah, so I think that's pretty much good. We have ended at 12 o'clock, which is actually just on time. So thank you so much to Team Light Flight for presenting. You did a wonderful job and we are we will be ending this session now and going into a break time for 15 minutes. Okay, so it's 12.10 now. We would like to welcome the next team, which is Team Shake It Off, uh, including Divya Venkatraman, Budi Kedia, Cassandra Schroeder, and Isabella Barrera. Uh, you guys can feel free to share your screen and we'll be beginning your presentation at 12.15 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, Team Shake It Off, it's uh, about 12.15 now, so you can begin your presentation. Um, so that's Divya Venkatram and Bubi Kedia and Isabella Barrera. Our judges are ready, right? We have to check that because that's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds okay. um, good. All right. So we are going to 
Okay, I'm gonna set the timer. Your time begins now. Hello, everyone, and good morning or afternoon. I'm Bridget Venkatraman. I'm Boovy Kedia. I'm Cassandra Schroeder. And I'm Isabella Barrera. And we are Team Shake It Off. A quick story about our name before we start is that we are targeting Parkinson's disease and its symptoms, such as tremors or shaking, and essentially wanting to turn it off, so Team Shake It Off. And you can see the title on our slide, and we're in the prompt research in the age category 13 to 17. So our problem statement is that so many people around the world face Parkinson's disease, yet there's no effective cure and the treatment options that are there are extremely expensive. So we wanted to offer an affordable and accurate way to treat this disease using a newly proposed sound therapy. The question that we're trying to answer through this experiment is what are the effects of different sources of sounds on Parkinson's disease by measuring the locomotor and cognitive ability in rats? Our hypothesis was that if all sound frequencies are ordered from most to least effective on Parkinson's disease, they would follow the order of ultrasonic sounds, low frequency sounds, and infrasonic sounds, because as more heat is generated from the sound waves, a lesion interrupts abnormal activities such as the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Here, we have decided to compile a list of few key terms that would be needed to run this, this experiment, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on, but feel free to ask us any questions you might have or refer back to the slide if need be. Would you believe that studies have shown that Parkinson's disease and other types of dementia overtake cancer as their kind's greatest fear? The severity of Parkinson's pretends tremendous care needs, as shown by the quote in Amy's story. Additionally, the treatment is very costly. To see more about what others think about this disease and the prevalence of our research, let's look at our survey results. We'll be sharing the most important question on our survey today. This survey got over 132 participants. Let's go over the data. More than 99% of participants said yes to the first question, which was that our research experiment will help patients with Parkinson's disease and ease their lifestyles, as you can see in the first pie chart. This is exactly what this experiment hopes to achieve. Furthermore, we have added another question on the slide, but we will be moving on to the solution, first talking about the materials needed. Here's the list. Now for the sake of time, let's move on to the experimental procedure. So obviously our experimental procedure was a bit more detailed in the procedure and the proposal. However, for the sake of time, we're gonna make it a little bit shorter for the presentation. The first step is diluting the TCE standard chemical solution with the solvent of distilled water to make a diluted solution that's not harmful for rats to inhale. Then we actually induce the TCE solution into the sponge covers of the rat cages so that the spongy texture absorbs the chemical allowing the rats to breathe it in. Then we just make a maze using simple cardboard procedures and then move on to the next step which is actually using that maze to test steps one and two. The way this will be done is that there will be a control group with the rats not inducted with the TCE solution, and then there will be a group with the TCE induction. And then the rat group with the TCE induction should have a slower time through the maze since they should have symptoms of Parkinson's disease such as cognitive and locomotive disability. The next step is the bulk of our experiment, which is actually exposing the rat group with the TCE induction to different sounds for one hour periods with 10 minute gaps in between for a vast period of two hours. And this abnormal timing is actually to make sure that the rats are exposed to the sounds in an effective way to generate accurate results without conditioning their brains to adapt to the sound. The next two steps are to actually test step five the first part is using the maze test again to test the rat groups with the control of no sound exposure and the different groups with the sound exposure to essentially see measure their locomotive and cognitive ability. Then we will use a rat PET scan to measure the dopamine levels of each of the same groups because lower dopamine levels is connected to Parkinson's disease. Then we will be able to conclude that the rat group with the fastest maze time and the highest dopamine levels had the best sound exposure to treat Parkinson's. Now, here are our predictions based on numerous scientific experiments done previously. However, the only thing that will yield us accurate results is actually performing this experiment, which we hope to do in the future. As you can see in figure one, the TCE solution was successful in replicating Parkinson's disease in the rat models due to their longer maze times. 
This is true because locomotor and cognitive inability are symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And since the TCE-induced rat models had a harder time using their locomotor and cognitive function, they are showing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In the next figure, we test the groups with different sound exposures to, with the rat maze. The results predicted here were that the control with no sound would actually take the longest time to run the maze and all the way till the ultrasonic sound, which will take the shortest time to run the maze. We predicted these results because ultrasonic sound emits the most heat and the heat actually helps symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In the next figure, we test the same exact groups except with the rat PET scan to trace the dopamine levels. Here, the results are sort of similar, where the control gets the lowest dopamine levels, all the way to ultrasonic sound, which gets the highest dopamine levels. And we predicted these results because the ultrasonic sound's most heat emitted also affects the basal ganglia, which is where Parkinson's develops. And that's what causes the dopamine levels to increase to treat the disease. Based on our experience and research, we have found that sound therapy is very cost effective. And through this new possible treatment, we can help millions of people all around the world like Amy. So these are our references. And thank you so much. Once again, especially after the pandemic, we've been in staying, staying inside for a majority of the day, exposed to so many different artificial sounds. So the success of this project can really lead to more studies with human Parkinson's patients, offering a novel and affordable way to treat this disease. And I have a neighbor down the road who has Parkinson's, and I hope this really helps. So just to end it on a really impactful note, these are a few testimonials from a few study from the study we conducted. Thank you so much. Have a great day, judges. Did the team shake it off and our judges can ask questions for three minutes. Hi, wonderful research, guys. I have a few really just quick things. The first one's just kind of a, a suggestion. Um, I saw you're using adult male rats. I would also really highly suggest including females in there as well um, because, well, first of all, the NA NIH is starting to mandate the use of females and in, in many, many, many diseases and even just general physiological functions, there are serious differences or, or noticeable differences between males and females. So that's just a suggestion. Um, my next question is or something to think about is um, how your how you're dosing the rats with the TCE. Um, I understand that you're putting it in the in the sponge filter, um, but it's it's difficult to control dosage through inhalation. So something you might think about is how you're ensuring all rats are really getting the same amount. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, and finally, just like a bit of semantics, um, when you're measuring the dopamine with the PET scan, you're, you're really looking at the activity rather than the levels. And if you wanted to look at like levels, how much is physically there, I think, and the, and the other judges, or if you guys have an idea on this can help out, something you might do is, is microdialysis or something along the lines, but that's really, you know, that's really advanced and I wouldn't expect anyone to know that. But overall, this was a very, very um, important project to take on. So good job, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for the suggestions. I'd like to add, um, uh, we may have forgotten to mention this, but for the rat thing, I definitely agree with you. The only thought that we came up with, um, I was wondering if you maybe had like advice on this, is that maybe like, that, that would add another experimental variable. So we were wondering, oh, maybe just do the male rats first and then maybe another experiment to do with the female rats. So would that be like a big change if like a new control variable, experimental variable added if we do that? It, it would be, but it is very, you're on the exact perfect track on saying, you know, we'll do this one first and then we'll include this one next. So that's exactly the right line of thinking. Thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, we will definitely take into consideration and like think about all the topics that you mentioned. You're welcome. This was a really good, good project to undertake. Thank you. Thank you. Any of the other judges have any other questions to add on to that? I just have one question. One, uh, this is not a question. 
Um, so first of all, I would like to congratulate. That is really a very good presentation, and the way you have uh, done the research, uh, you know, uh, your literature that is quite uh, strong. You know, people generally what they do is they just write uh, research. You know, the review of literature in science. But I strongly recommend that um, you know the more tabula tabulated form is most you know uh, in trend right now for the profession, and for me it was really appreciated. Um, so I just have one question because uh, I was just uh, hearing this again and again that you were trying to increase the dopamine levels to deal with Parkinson's. Uh, is that correct? Um, that you, if you increase the level of dopamine, and you will uh, cure the Parkinson's. Or you have so essentially, actually, what we were doing, the dopamine was mentioned to actually test the um, experiment. So what we'll be doing is using the sound therapy. So you're kind of right, except. To, to increase the dopamine levels, we'll be using the sound, the ultrasonic sound to do so since the heat affects the dopamine levels in the basal ganglia. Okay, okay. thank you. So it was, again, it was a really great presentation. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does our third judge have any questions for this team? Uh, hi guys, um, you guys is really young and I'm really impressed by the amount of thinking that you've put in and the efforts that you've put in. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, uh, the fact that you say that uh, these sound waves, the heat effect is, is what's helping the Parkinson's. Would you like to elaborate a bit more on what you've read uh, about that uh, and exactly why you are basing your effects on this particular line of thinking? Just a thought. Yeah, so essentially what happens is, um, so ultrasonic waves are have the highest frequency. So research has shown and experiments have shown that that does emit, emit the most heat out of all sounds that we've chosen for the experiment. And then how the heat actually affects the basal ganglia is um, shown through multiple numerous, numerous experiments because obviously there is a lot of research being done in Parkinson's since it's such a prevalent disease. And, you know, researching upon like many of the research articles that's already been written before and skimming through the whole thing or reading it thoroughly, we found out that the heat actually um, using some, like since scientists actually tested on human patients, since mm -hmm. we couldn't do that only because we don't, we think it'll be better to go with rats first and then humans. Mm -hmm. But it's shown that that actually majorly affects the activity in the basal ganglia, because I think they were using like MRIs to do so or fMRIs or other um, measurement tools. And so the heat is shown to really affect the like activity there, which then affects the dopamine levels produced as mentioned through a bunch of research. And then, which then does the rest of the experiment that we explained. And yeah, so there were in their citations references, there are a few articles that talk about that. Right, it might just help to dig in what exactly are these mechanisms by which this is happening, because I personally haven't heard of that. I do understand that sound therapy can definitely, uh, through the thalamocortical circuits, uh, mediate uh, locomotion, like you say. Uh, but how is it affecting the basal ganglia and the dopamine pathway would, would definitely be an add-on to uh, sort of more consolidate what you are saying here and, and help you uh, think through. So just a suggestion there, yeah. Yes, um, yeah, definitely. We'll keep yeah. that in mind and we'll definitely dig, dig deeper. Thank you so much for all of your feedback and suggestions. Um, now we'll move on to our next team, which is the Radical Scientists by Madhura Manjanath and Lynn Diaz. So to our next team, the Radical Scientists, your time begins now. Hello, um, we're the Radical Scientists. My name is Madhura Manjanov, and this is my partner, Linda Diaz. And um, we're going to be exploring what is the relationship between ASMR and reactive attachment disorder. So our age category was 13 to 17, and we're doing it on research, and our frontier is neurological disorders. So first, let's begin with talking about what is ASMR. So ASMR is short form for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And this is a sensory phenomenon of feeling relaxation and tingles in your spine and scalp, sometimes throughout the rest of your body. Um, it's usually triggered by relaxing, gentle sounds um, provided through videos, music, person. Um, it's, uh, it has recently become very popular throughout YouTube. Um, it's generally provided with people by people with gentle, calming voices, and some people actually 
um, experience ASMR differently, and some may not also experience it at all. And this is called misophonia. So what is reactive attachment disorder? So reactive attachment disorder, also called RAD, is a disorder that's caused by an insecure attachment to parents or caregivers. And that can lead to anxiety and less um, trusting relationships between parents and children. It often occurs in children who are raised in overcrowded orphanages, were moved between foster homes, or they had mentally ill parents that weren't able to fully care for them because that leads to less trusting relationships. So it is characterized by refusal to engage in social interaction with peers, failure to ask for assistance when they're distressed or have difficult tasks, not seeking or responding to comfort when distressed, and unexplainable fits of withdrawal, fear, sadness, and irritability. So here are some reasons why we think there may be a link between RAD and ASMR. So a positive relationships, such as that between a healthy relationship between a parent and child, are linked with increases in oxytocin, which is a hormone that's nicknamed the love hormone because it's involved so much with so social interactions. And studies actually show that oxytocin can bind to receptors located in the medial prefrontal cortex, which was actually a region activated during ASMR, according to one study. And so the activation of the regions activated by ASMR are actually associated with caring behaviors, which includes that between a parent and child. So this actually shows that ASMR allows for an experience of comfort from a healthy relationship because the same parts of the brain are triggered. And it may be engaging the way, the brain in a way that a person normally depends on a caregiver or a parent for. So the MPFC, a significantly activated region, both during social bonding and ASMR, is related to many important social behaviors, which shows that ASMR may actually activate the brain the same way that social engagement would. So exposing kids with RAD to ASMR might actually ease their symptoms of RAD. So that leads us to our hypothesis, which is that if people who are diagnosed with RAD and respond to ASMR are engaged with ASMR, then their symptoms will be alleviated. So how we're going to go about doing this experiment is first having our participants so we're going to collect our participants using random sampling, where we put out an advertisement with kids um, with RAD and send that to parents who have it. And after one month, we're going to use a random number generator to pick 100 kids from the list who signed up. And we're also going to use random assignment, where we assign kids a random number from 1 to 10, use that as their identity, and place it into a random number generator to create two groups of children. One group will be the experimental group, and one will be the control group. And the reason we're doing it like this, the reason we're doing it like this is to keep the data objective and remove any biases so that it represents the whole population. So another important thing here is that not all people respond to ASMR. So this study would be targeted towards the people with RAD who do respond to ASMR. So um, the way we would make sure our participants respond to this would be we would play a uh, video of ASMR to all our participants that have been randomly selected. And if they reply yes to feeling the sensation, um, we will continue with them being a participant in your study. And if they um, repeat no, then we can't include them in your study and we'll um, select another person um, from the list and if they respond to ASMR. So our experiment variables, for our independent variable, it will be whether the children are exposed to the ASMR videos and if they are, they will be exposed one hour before sleeping every day for two consecutive weeks. And the dependent variable will be whether they increase, have increased social interaction and whether their symptoms of RAD are decreased. So we have two measurable outcomes here. One is a functional MRI, and we'll use this to scan the brain in both groups during the same time during the two week period. And we'll be looking for changes in the activation of the medial prefrontal cortex region between both groups. And the second one is we're gonna be assigning a puzzle task. So this will be assigned because a symptom of RAD is actually that um, kids won't ask for help when they're in times of stress. So supposedly before the two week period of listening to ASMR, kids should not be asking for help or it should be less than the number of times that they would be asking for help after the two-week period. So we will be recording the numbers a number of times um, that they ask for help when they're completing a puzzle task one day before and after the start of, um, sorry, after the end of ASMR and we'll be comparing the number of times that they ask for help. So the steps of our experiment, first we're going to get the random sample and assignment of the participants to check if they respond to ASMR. 
Then we're going to assign them the puzzle task and record how much they ask for help and how comfortable they are asking for help. Then the experimental group will watch ASMR videos every day for two weeks. Then we will record their brain activity using fMRI scans and we'll do that for both groups. Then both groups will complete the puzzle task again and we're going to record the times they ask for help that time. And we're going to compare the changes between before and after and between the groups and check if our hypothesis was supported. So some possible social impacts of this, if our hypothesis turns out to be correct, this study could pave the way for more studies um, concerned with the application of ASMR for other social disorders. And it could also um, con consider ASMR as a treatment for RAD. So how can these results be interpreted? So if it's correct, ASMR can be further researched for its potential as a clinical treatment for RAD. Children who respond to ASMR can use it as their own personal treatment and its potential for use is possibly very widespread since ASMR is readily available and easily accessible. And further areas of studies may also include ASMR's potential for treatment for other social disorders like social anxiety disorder and panic disorder. Thank you for your time. Thank you to the radical scientists and the judges will have three minutes for questions now. Hi guys, thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, would you guys consider um, a possible habituation that your participants could have with the ASMR content or even the puzzle for that matter? And if yes, like how would you account for it? The puzzle would be the same difficulty level, but it would be different each time to make sure that they don't get used to doing the puzzle. And the mm -hmm. ASMR, we would continue to use different types of ASMR in different videos so that they don't get used to the same kind. Sure. So you take that into consideration. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, uh, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so actually, I don't have a question. I just want to, you know, uh, appreciate the effort that you did. Um, and you said that you were in the age group of 13 to 17, and if you were at that age explaining uh, independent, independent uh, variables with the hypothesis testing and everything, and I guess you're going with a pretty good speed because, you know, um, students at 21, 22, 23, and even 24, even doing their PhD, are not clear with the hypothesis testing and independent, independent variables and some of the statistical and research methodologies proportions. So I really appreciate it. Keep doing and make sure take uh, uh, to, uh, you make sure that you give uh, the research methodology and statistics equal important as you give them to them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I have just I have a quick question just for my own general knowledge. What what's the difference between RAD and insecure attachment? Is it just kind of like a further step? beyond insecure attachment or is it something different? Yeah, it just develops from insecure attachment. Yeah, so it's like um, the disorder that happens as a result of insecure attachment. Okay, thank you. And I have one one just kind of quick suggestion, perhaps adding a, a neurotypical group as a control just to compare if the ASMR, if, if what you're doing is, that, is, is different from what it would do to a control or just, you know, I don't know, I'm all about controls. So that's just a mm -hmm. thought. Yeah, we'll take your suggestion into consideration. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, by the way. Thank you. Do our judges have any other questions they would like to ask? Um, seeing none, does the audience have any questions for this team? You can either type it in the chat or just unmute yourself and say it. Either way, it's fine. Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you to the radical scientists. We enjoyed your presentation. Awesome. So I'm going to present the basic information for the next team presentation. So this one is SP2 by Maggie and Joseph, and they wanted us to note that we do have a trigger warning. So this project touches upon the topic of suicide. So if you are in distress, you can feel free to 
leave the Zoom meeting at any time, either now or during the presentation. And be sure to note that there are mental health resources for you that you can reach out to. So with that said, if our project members are in the, let me check. Are Maggie and Joseph in the meeting right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So in that case, you guys can set up your presentation and share your screen. Your time begins now. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Maggie. And I am Joseph. And for our project for the IYBS 2020, we chose to look into the healthcare and public health category, specifically focusing on the second issue of identifying a public health issue adjacent to neuroscience and developing a solution, which is what we came up with here, SP2 or DISP, depending on how you read your chemical formula, stands for Science and Policy for Suicide Prevention. So to give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we're just going to introduce why we care about suicide as a neuropsych issue, why it's a problem, introduce SB2, and then our two main components of it, a policy basis and a database basis, where we want to introduce several different things. And then we'll go into conclusions just as far as our next steps in this project. So to give a brief introduction, suicide specifically within the United States is a 10th leading cause of death and is a second leading cause of death among young people. And while our project is mainly limited to the United States, it's important to note that much of what we're saying about suicide can actually be extrapolated to the world at large. It takes over 800,000 lives per year on a global scale. The reason why this is a problem despite its common prevalence as an issue is that specifically within the United States, rates have actually been consistently rising since 2000. And this is largely correlated with high gun ownership rates in the United States, which results in a high attempt lethality. So you can see here that uh, owning firearms and using them to attempt suicide results in a success or success, so to speak, resulting in death uh, far greater than alternative methods. And on that note, it's important to consider that uh, neuropsychological information is not considered heavily in determining whether or not someone should be able to access a firearm only on a nationwide basis, taking into account if someone has been involuntarily hospitalized for some sort of mental derangement. Helping is specifically hard in this issue because as we try to quantify better methods, we find that the research is incredibly multifaceted and it's hard to pin down one way to define whether someone is at risk for suicide, whether they should be cleared and able to purchase a firearm. The lack of cohesion across resources means that there is not a common database for researchers to use, which limits population level analysis. And without science-based metrics, it's difficult to promote effective policy, which leads us to our solution, SB2. SB2 is our solution on the basis that we believe that science and policy must be bridged, that researchers will not see the decreases they want to see in suicide without effective policy, and policymakers cannot make effective policy without the pursuit of science. So on that note, we cover two things. I'm going to cover the policy basis of SB2, and this is on the basis that science-based policies are those founded on robust statistical methods that are designed to innovate. These are things that we think uh, should be statistically based. They should be integrating peer-reviewed literature, and we need to have this integration of the two in order to engage policies that are not just static, but are dynamic and changing along with the literature as it advances and we advance our understanding of things like suicide. Uh, and here at the bottom, we have several different policies that are kind of perspective or prospective. So several of these, especially those on the left, have already been implicated, but some of our more novel implications or ideas on the right are more literature based and these are more future oriented. So psychological evaluations uh, in a simple sense uh, may be validated scales pertaining to suicide that are currently implemented in certain states, but also cognitive measures. Biologic evaluations may include peripheral biomarkers in the blood system. And as we develop literature, we should be integrating novel methods that can allow for greater algorithmic process to better engage a screening process more specific than the current method. On this note, SB2 is also going to be on the basis that we think that policy should be engaged across levels. It should be accessible to all kinds of people and not only at a national level, but also at a state and local level. SB2 is designed to take the most recent information from psych epi, neuropsych, and clinical psych and make it accessible to people no matter who they are so that they can integrate it with their elected officials. So for instance, here's a permit to purchase policy brief that we wrote up. And we made this so that it could be moldable as you can see here at the bottom. Uh, so that people can actually take it, Lo and local leaders can actually just take this and engage with their elected officials as to suggest that this is something that is not only left for policymakers at the top, but something that is accessible and may be posed by anyone. All these policy briefs proposed by SB2 
would also be followed with a detailed appendix and related information and citations. On that note, I'll leave it to Maggie to cover the database. Yeah, so like Joseph said, we also suggest the creation of an intersectional database that would serve several purposes. Um, first, it would allow gun sellers um, an easy way to see if a potential buyer is at risk for suicide. Of course, we recognize that such an algorithm right now is not possible, but through the second benefit, which is as various sectors compile this data, it will give researchers the opportunity to conduct that population level analysis necessary um, to study suicide risk factors. And all of this would be possible because healthcare workers are able to distribute the relevant data through the database. So here we've created a mock-up of what the database might look like. Um, on the first page, you would, allow, uh, you would be able to select who you are. So say you're a federal firearms licensee. Once you log in, you would be able to enter the buyer's information and it would tell you whether the person is someone at risk for suicide. And say if you're a researcher, you could select some parameters and from there you'd get a spreadsheet of all the relevant data. And finally, if you're a healthcare professional, you'd be able to go in and upload data in various ways. Now to quickly cover conclusions and next steps for this process, let's look at policy for instance. Clear limitation here is that the briefs, we have designed them to be formalized and include technical jargon for legal efficacy because we do think that policy should be specific. Uh, and the next step here would be if people are truly to engage with this on even local levels, these policies need to be understandable in layman's terms. So we suggest an interactive website where people can interact with specific terms from the policy briefs to understand them and possibly also providing video conferences from S2P, SP2 staff. Uh, but this would require financial investment. But with all that said, currently just providing these policies on an intersectional level and across levels of government would allow for an immediate benefit to leaders. As for the database, we would have to seek out web developers and legal professionals to help us create a user-friendly site that would ensure we aren't breaking IRB or HIPAA laws. And as for feasibility, of course, we'd need investment to support the web functionality. So yes, yeah, such a database would create better communication of data among various fields, which would then allow for a population level analysis of suicide risk factors. We just wanna reiterate, this is by nature a public health issue that must integrate both science and policy our references, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you to Team SP2. Uh, I just will have three minutes for questions now. I have a quick question. Um, you had mentioned looking for biomarkers. Could you tell me more about what you would specifically include in that? Yeah, so we've reviewed a bit of literature in preparing for this. And of course, that's just one day's of research in our part. But um, some of the things that have been listed as potential biomarkers are things like serotonin levels or like um, gene abnormal, uh, abnormalities in genes coding for like serotonin transporters or receptors. And there's also been things like gray matter volume, white matter volume that have been shown to have differences um, between people who have attempted suicide and healthy individuals. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I will just say, yeah, I will just say it was a very impressive um, uh, presentation because, you know, <clears throat> society is still, and I guess it will take a lot of time to recover, you know, from everyone to just get out from it. Uh, and, uh, you know, every possible solution should be applied. And I guess science and policy making is a very wonderful solution so that two different branches can come together and just focus on a single thing and, you know, can just uh, get a very possible solution. So for now, I don't have any questions, but I really appreciate the work you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next team is Team Nervous Sensor, who will be presenting at 1 p.m., which is in two minutes. And they're in the 13 to 17 age category. So are the team members present right now? Team Nervous Sensor. I'm going to set the timer now, and you may begin. My name is Adwe Ganguly. I'm Gran Chiadev, and we are NervoSensor. Our teammate Vanessa couldn't be here with us today, but she did send in recordings of our slides. Hi, I'm Vanessa Rigoloso. 
People who suffer from anxiety disorder are often faced with panic attacks, one of the hardest aspects of the disorder to deal with. For many, these panic attacks come suddenly and feel unpredictable, which makes facing and foreseeing them challenging. The inability to predict or recognize when a panic attack will occur makes those with anxiety often feel helpless and vulnerable. I personally have suffered from severe anxiety with panic attacks for years, and I've had countless panic attacks. They're difficult to identify ahead of time, leading to treatment strategies being implemented too late. There are many others with experiences similar to mine and even worse than mine. So let's give those with anxiety hope. A 2011 study done by the Southern Methodist University published findings that suggest that these panic attacks aren't actually as sudden as they appear. Your body shows physiological changes for around an hour beforehand, but your brain rejects feeling these changes. The physical panic attack actually occurs at the end of the 60 minutes. We've engineered a two-part solution to tackle these out-of-the-blue panic attacks. May I present to you the NervoSensor. Essentially, the NervoSensor is a pulse and body temperature tracking wristband that is connected via Bluetooth to a chest patch that tracks breathing. When physiological changes begin occurring before a panic attack, such as an increase in respiratory rate, an increase in heart rate, or an increase in body temperature, the wristband will release a, co will release a cooling essential oil as well as prompt the user to breathe slowly. The essential oils are implemented as they are known as an effective alternative to medication in dealing with panic attacks, while the cooling effects of these oils will help regulate body temperature, which often rise before a panic attack. In an effort to receive feedback on the demand and feasibility of our product, we conducted a survey with over 100 participants. Some significant results from our survey are that almost two thirds of participants suffer from diagnosed or undiagnosed anxiety, while over half said they suffer from anxiety induced panic attacks. A key takeaway from these two models is simply the fact that we have a fairly large target audience who would benefit from our product. In model three, it is displayed that some of the most common symptoms of panic attacks are sudden sweating, which result from a rise in body temperature over a quarter of respondents, hyperventilation over 40%, and an increased heart rate over 60%. These symptoms are all ones that are targeted and remedied by NervoSensor. Support and backing for our product is displayed in model four, as more than three quarters of respondents said they would buy a device such as ours to help avoid panic attacks. Now, one of the most common ways in which respondents dealt with their panic attacks was by taking deep or controlled breaths. Our product, prompt, our product prompts a reminder to the user to focus on their breathing, which can be another contributor to avoiding panic attacks. Finally, over a quarter of participants used essential oils for anxiety before, while over half used essential oils for other reasons. This high level of usage would likely make people feel more comfortable using essential oils to help with panic attacks, as many have already used them before and seen the beneficial effects. Unfortunately, we did not have the available technology to design a real prototype, so instead we designed a blueprint. The baseline technology we use is similar to that of a Fitbit. The screen, like of a Fitbit, only shows the alert to breathe when it recognizes that all of the monitored senses are going into overdrive. There are sensors on the top and sides of the wristband for the most accurate screenings. The carts are located on the insides of our wrists, since this is the most sensitive area that the cooling sensation will provide. The patch, which goes on the chest, works with accelerometers embedded in them. The accelerometers detect chest movements as one inhales and exhales, and it also connects via Bluetooth to the wristband and the app. So we want to launch a corresponding NervoSensor app along with our product, similar to the one of a Fitbit. The homepage, as you can see, displays your summary statistics, which include your heart rate, your breathing rate, and your body temperature. It also monitors when all of your senses start to become heightened and it shows when the dropper mechanism was activated, like on the screen, it shows at 5 p.m. But however, this does not send a notification to your phone because we feel that knowing you're about to enter a panic attack might actually cause a worse to panic. The next page allows you to see graph data of your senses, and we've also included a shopping tab where you can immediately order more oils for your convenience. So not only does our feedback show that we would have demand for our product, but all technology used is already available, including, including the groundbreaking respiratory patch. The patch does not yet have a price estimate as, as it is relatively newer technology whose price fluctuates with demand. But a similar product has an estimate of $100 to make and a Fitbit costs around $17 to make. So our cost estimate to produce NervoSensor is about $117. We will sell our product for $500, which may seem expensive at first, but the benefits as an alternative to medication outweighs the price. So in terms of the social impact of NervoSensor, it truly has the potential to revolutionize how anxiety is treated, and it offers people a different option to the medical route. In addition, people will be able to use one digital platform to cope with anxiety and everyone can heal together. 
Nervous sensor is also a product that is more user-friendly to young people, which is important because students often suffer the most from environmentally induced anxiety due to school and work. Listen to your products. The product will identify early panic attack signs and ultimately stop panic attacks in their tracks. This is a natural alternative medication and its price is affordable compared to the cost of daily medications, considering how much money you'll spend on them in the long term. Additionally, the product will promote a happier and healthier lifestyle improving lives everywhere. Nervous Sensor successfully connects neuroscience, technology, and innovation to tackle one of the most ubiquitous mental disorders in the world. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you to Team Nervous Sensor. Now judges can ask their questions. Do any of the judges have questions for this team? Would you mind going back to the to your blueprints, to your drawings for me? Sure. So this is the blueprint of our wristband. Um, like I said, the screen, it looks very similar to a Fitbit, like the one I have here, the screen, which will show the prompt to breathe. And it'll have sensors on the inside of your wrist on the top and the sides, and when it connects, the carts will be located on the inside of your wrist to drop the essential oil and uh, the water here in a two to one ratio, because that'll provide the max cooling sensation and because your wrist is most sensitive to temperatures. Excellent. So for the, the heart rate monitor, the patch, is that, do you always have to wear that if, you're, if you wanna use the product? Uh, Yes, it's uh, the uh, patch doesn't monitor heart rate. It actually monitors uh, your respiratory rate. The wristband can uh, pick up on your pulse. And um, yes, but we the, we plan to design it in uh, breathable and thin technology, so you kind of you don't notice that it's even there. Okay, excellent. Because that would have been my only you know question is would I want to wear something that I can feel all day, but but you've answered that, so it's very, very pro, proactive. Any other questions? I uh, just want to congratulate, congratulate the presenters. They've done quite a good job. And um, um, it is a very good uh, uh, presentation, I must say, and a very uh, uh, good opportunity and innovation, as, this, uh, as, as I'm saying. But I strongly recommend to um, show this blueprint to anyone who is uh, already aware of. So uh, anyone of you working in the field of algorithm, science, uh, machine learning, anything, or just have any idea that you know how this will work. Okay. Because you know there are cert uh, certain confounders that may affect the reading that you are trying specifically trying to take. If you go to the concept of the Fitbit and uh, uh, the other you know uh, devices then it is fine i guess but they have their specific algorithm they are, you know dealing with the specific kind of data that they are trying to do. and if you're trying to get also the respiratory and the you know heart rate variability or also then you may have to you know improve some of the aspects and i strongly recommend to um, um you know there is a person uh, in uh, you must have heard of the uh, Nielsen Nielsen company it is a marketing um, consulting uh, industry and they indeed make um, Google Fitbit specifically for Google so um, there is a guy over there uh, Ramakrishnan and he is super responsive if you just get in contact with him in LinkedIn and show your product I'm sure that he will give you some great um, um, ideologies and even you, you, you can help you with that you can just try it thank you for your advice yeah. and i uh, again i uh, appreciate the uh, you know the products that you've been showing on the app it, it's quite you know legitimate to you know show the um, essential oils and the other products on the uh, app itself so that you know people can buy from there itself. So again, congratulate, I congratulate you all and a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, 
Yeah, I had a small concern. Maybe you guys might have thought of it or might not. Just putting it out there for you guys to think. So, for example, if there is a say a very acute uh, sort of stressor uh, for the person who's who's wearing this uh, wearable device, and um, you know, uh, it's it's about like how you say that you know uh, there's a wolf right there. <laughs> you know, there's there's some sort of alarm right there when it's not really a panic attack. so how would you guys think about uh you know uh going around that problem so yeah your thoughts on that um so when we we researched that when you are entering a panic attack your heart rate comes into 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate that you should reach um so this it, this panic attack um heart rate is actually higher than most heart rates of course obviously if you see a wolf in the woods out of the middle of nowhere um then it could potentially set off all of that but we're still trying to work on a little bit of kinks we did keep in mind for exercise how that would all increase your heart rate your body temperature and all that so there is an exercise mode and to it it will like it'll be it'll there'll be a uh, calibration period when you open the app so it'll uh customize to each person you know so, so that'll have to be done manually is it like if a person's yes. uh, okay yes all right so if you're going around for a trek or something in the woods you don't have to <laughs> you yeah. have to switch it off yeah? <laughs> yeah all right great okay thank you Thank you to your team for presenting. Thank you to the Nervo Sensors, and that is the end of this presentation time. Our next presentation will be by Aperio soon, so I will just put that up right now. So thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, and is Team Aperio here right now? I believe I see them in the. Yes. Okay. So you guys can set up while our judges are finishing up their final scores. So you may begin now. Hello, my name is Sofia Pronina and these are my partners Hala Klossy and Wyatt Razen. We're in the 13 to 17 age category and are addressing the first neuroeconomics prompt as to why humans make bad decisions with money. Today we're super excited to talk to you about money illusion and how to combat it with our app Aperio. In textbook theory, economists follow the assumption of homo economicus and that humans are rational beings. But humans aren't always rational. This is exemplified in an experiment conducted by Weber et al. Take a look at these two options. You could choose between a house with 23% appreciation and inflation of 25% or a house with 1% depreciation and inflation of 1%. Which would you choose? According to Weber's questionnaire results, despite a 2% real loss for both options, most people were biased in choosing house 1. This is due to the money illusion phenomenon, a cognitive bias where humans think of money in nominal rather than real terms. One important tool against money illusion is financial literacy, an idea captured in a 2020 study by Dariot et al, which collected data on choices similar to the one discussed in the previous slide. As seen in figure 1A, in general, those with a higher tendency to choose the higher nominal value, failing to consider inflation, were more likely to err. The notion that this trend can be attributed to financial literacy is corroborated by figure 1B, which demonstrates that in congruent situations in which a higher nominal value corresponded to a higher nominal value, uh, those with desperate financial literacy levels tended to score similarly, while those in non-congruent situations where a higher nominal value did not correspond to a higher real value, those with high financial literacy strongly outperformed their less financially literate counterparts. As seen in the experiment previously described by Weber et al, money illusion has a neurological impact on consumers that changes the way they consume goods and the framework in which they view currency. As such, neurological findings need to be taken into account when developing money theory to create policy that accurately addresses the needs of real people. Research on the neuroscience of money illusion has largely focused on both fMRI imaging and behavioral evidence. While a higher financial literacy dampens the money illusion effect, In a study by Schaefer et al, they found that most people preferred the nominal framework due to its salience and easiness to process in terms of their own lives. 
This can be visually seen in figure 2a and 2b, where, according to Weber et al., the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, or VMPFC, exhibited a stronger blood oxygen level marker in response to nominally higher incomes compared to the nominally lower incomes, despite an equal real value. This can also be seen in figure 2d, which shows that while VMPFC activity increased with income in both conditions, it was always higher in the high price setting compared to the low price setting. This imaging supports the idea of money illusion. In a similar study, Montague and Burns discovered the theory of common neural currency, or that the reward processing areas of the brain, including the VMPFC, as well as the orbitofrontal and striatal circuits, which can be seen in figure 2c, react to stimuli such as food, social, or social rewards, and money in similar ways. Both of these findings show the neurological backing for the theory of money illusion and support the theoretical idea that, according to Guy et al., money illusion is the interference of the emotional or symbolic value of money with its purely instrumental purpose. And while money illusion has a very clear personal downside, its effects are felt through the entire economy as well. Money illusion comes into conflict with the dependence of most economic thought on a false sense of human rationality. For instance, in the face of a recession as pictured in figure 3a, a government may take the traditional Keynesian route of enacting expansionary fiscal policy, hoping to raise aggregate demand and return to full output in doing so. But if the public responds irrationally, this fiscal response may not yield the same result as it would in a perfectly rational world, leaving the economy producing at an inefficient rate below the production possibilities frontier. One way of avoiding this ma these macroeconomic consequences has been attributed, uh, has been attempted in Chile as a prototype of sorts, the Unidad de Fomento or UF. While some prices are measured in physical pesos, others are expressed through the UF, an abstract value that has no corresponding monetary note. Used in investment-related purchases, it represents the cost of a sample basket of goods and thus acts in a manner that remains constant despite inflation. With a daily peso exchange rate, it can reflect inflationary changes while promoting a sense of stability. That being said, such a solution is not necessarily feasible in the immediate term. The policy switch would require difficult political maneuvering and time to transition. In the meantime, therefore, we can work to combat money illusion by moving individuals to a state of higher financial literacy and numeracy through the use of technology. This is exactly what the Aperio app serves to do. The Aperio app makes finance accessible by combating financial illiteracy and cognitive bias. It does so by first providing resources that teach users basic economic and financial concepts. Additionally, to mitigate money illusion, the user can also refer to Aperio the wizard in making rational financial decisions. The users first input their financial concerns, currency, and other relevant criteria into the Aperio wizard calculator. Next, utilizing the user's inputted data and an API connecting to trusted economic databases, Aperio then implements machine learning and an algorithm to give the user unbiased financial recommendations. In order to gauge the receptive scenario, we sent out a survey with the, uh, with the questions mentioned above to our target demographic, young adults. We chose young adults as they are likely to own smartphones, over 93% do, but are also most likely to be financially illiterate. Only 24% could demonstrate a foundational financial literacy. The empirical data above show that, of the young adults we surveyed, the vast majority of them find value in the Aperio. The Aperio app is accessible to a wide audience. This can be seen in the graph on the left, representing the amount of American adults possessing smartphones, which shows that 270 million adults have smartphone access. Looking to the right, we see that smartphone and internet access are common around the world. And while smartphone usage is steadily rising in developing nations, in-person seminars, a website, and other accessible options could be used to bridge any gaps. Thus, in all, while the marriage between neuroscience and economics can benefit both individuals and society at large through the creation of informed theories and subsequent policy, by failing to acknowledge the impact human behavior has on economics, theorists are missing a crucial piece of the picture. Although cognitive bias will always play a part in financial decisions, Aperio will combat the money illusion effect, ultimately leading to better outcomes. Thank you for your time, uh, and we are now open to questions. Thank you to Team Aperio. Now I just have three minutes for questions. I actually don't have any questions. I think that was wonderfully put together, wonderfully researched, and I think it's a very um, important topic and I think it's going to be very feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. So um, you are using neuroimaging techniques 
in diagnosing the financial responsibility of an individual like you you used um neuroimaging techniques uh, or you know uh, the data you mentioned at the first place the mri or fmri data you used this to to diagnose the financial responsibility right uh so no so the um we use two methods to prove money illusion and one of them is imaging using fmri but another is behavioral implications which oh, why it mentioned in the slides before that which because uh, there have been a lot of there has been a lot of behavioral empirical evidence the fmri is just to show that in your brain the, there is solid uh, imaging evidence that it that money illusion also exists so while it doesn't prove financial it doesn't um, we're not using imaging to prove financial literacy but it is to prove that money illusion exists yeah kind of elaborating upon that um, the the survey that discussed financial literacy was uh, individual self reported financial literacy i believe so if an individual you know maybe worked in finance or had some sort of background in that um, they could be dubbed financially literate according to this study whereas individuals who were not financially literate didn't have as much experience with finance and actually calculating things um, whereas the response in people's brains um, was more of a response that was non-discriminate so I believe the uh, actual neurological aspect of it is something that is human and then financial literacy is a way of coping with that. So uh, in the solution you proposed, you proposed two solutions, I guess. There was a video section and there was a chat wizard section. Am I right? Yes. So within the app, the Aperio app, uh, we're tackling two issues here, which is financial literacy and numeracy. So through the financial literacy, it's the educational component of our app where users can um, watch videos, read articles that describe finance in basic terms and make finance a lot more accessible. Whereas the chat feature, the Aperio Wizard Calculator, is used in combating human biases and making decisions. For instance, as we saw in the um, previous studies, such as in Weber et al., despite their being having equal results or equal real values, people still are swayed by nominal values and as such, the chat feature or the wizard calculator will allow the user to be a lot more rational because a machine is sort of stripping apart all of the glamour of inflation rates and currencies to then present a more clear cut form of decision. So uh, uh, in a nutshell, we can say that there is no role of any neuroimaging technique in the solution, I guess. Yeah, there's no neural imaging technique within the app. It's more so of a method of coping. Um, and the neural, the neural imaging techniques were utilized in proving how um, um, brain activity was increasing in the VMPFC, um, despite people knowing that the real values are the same. It's showing that as nominal values increase, people are swayed. And even if they're cognizant of the fact that um, the real values are the same, the VMPFC through blood oxygen markers is a lot more active. And just to add on that, makes that sense. yeah. yeah. Uh, as we said, there will always be cognitive bias in part when we make financial decisions. And that is largely due to the fact that the reward center of the brain as of now, while there has been a lot of research on it, there's still not clear cut solution uh, answers as to why certain things happen. So while we don't have imaging solutions uh, and that's not feasible at this time, this app is a great way of using current technology to solve the issue of money illusion. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, just uh, um, I'll just give to one suggestion. So the video that you will be creating, the short videos for the customers or the uh, individuals who are looking forward to get to the solution. So uh, I recommend that you know uh, because the video uh, you know watching of the video video viewing viewing ratio currently is less than thirty seconds for an individual. So if you're not so I would just like to apply some sort of neuromarketing or neuroeconomy technique over there so that you know at the, in the very first ten seconds you are grabbing the information and at the very second second you are uh, you know stating the uh, problem and in the very five seconds next five seconds you are stating the solution. So I, yeah. I would just like to yeah to, to make each video not more than 30 seconds to one second or one minute so that everything you can just divide all the videos into very small sections and also it is uh, when uh, so I studied a survey and a survey and these small chunks of videos were 90% much more uh, effective as compared to two to three minute or 10 minutes video. So just a suggestion, if you're looking forward to going through this, just uh, uh, take that into consideration. So, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, please. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's a very interesting and very valid point that you bring up. I think that people's attention spans won't last for an eight minute long video, especially since we're catering towards an audience who is less financially literate and would be intimidated by the world of finance. So your suggestions are something we'll definitely take into account. And thank you for your suggestions. Yeah, and also even tying that back to neuroscience. I mean, obviously, we have to understand how individuals' brains work to best teach them. So thank you. Very nice presentation and best of luck. Thank you to Imperio and also all the judges. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So thank you to this team. And next we'll be moving on to Team Shallow Reelers. We're going to give our judges some time to finish their forms. So in the meantime, yes, you can be. Okay, we're ready to go. I'm going to set the timer now and your team may begin now. Hello, we are the Shallow Reelers with Hannah, Irene, and Jeannie. We will be presenting deepfakes in the neuroethics category. Ever wondered how Mona Lisa would look in real life? This GIF is an interesting example of deepfake technology. But first, what are deepfakes? Deepfake is an umbrella term that ranges from synthesizing a voice to manipulating a physical likeness. In order to synthesize deepfake material, videos of a person are fed through AI neural networks, which study and encode the physical characteristics and likeness of a person. Over time, the quality of deepfakes have exponentially increased, as well as deepfake material across the internet. Low cost and efficiency has led to the widespread use, allowing detrimental content to affect both society and politics. Deepfake media is still legal despite unethical purposes and should have some limitations to the software used to create it. We'll be evaluating the beneficial implementations of deepfake technology. One common use of deepfake technology in the medical field in the development of disease detection. General adversarial networks, a type of deepfake technology, can synthesize images of realistic medical illnesses, such as skin lesions and tumors of different sizes and locations. In turn, these images are used to train AI net networks. Due to the efficiency and potential low cost of detecting diseases, more patients can be treated and accurately diagnosed. Deepfake technology can also be used for education. These neural networks have been used to reconstruct voices of Holocaust survivors and historical figures like JFK, which can bring a new perspective into historical education. Art is another beneficial Im implementation for deepfakes. As was shown previously, deepfakes can be used to animate art pieces like the Mona Lisa. Deepfakes have also been used as art exhibits themselves, like Dali's moving exhibit in the Dali Museum. Though deepfakes can be used beneficially, the more pressing issue is that a majority of deepfakes are being used for detrimental or malignant purposes. The first of these is misinformation. Deepfakes can be used to spread misinformation by using a physical likeness to have someone say or do things that they never did. For example, here's a deepfake of Barack Obama. You can see how something like this plus convincing audio could be used to spread misinformation. Deepfakes cause a lack of trust between the government, the media, and the public and spreads fake news that could sway an election, which is especially relevant now in 2020. According to a report by a cybersecurity firm, DeepTrace, 96% of all deepfake videos on, an inter on the internet fell under the category of non-consensual pornographic material. Almost all replace the faces of female celebrities onto other women. Deepfake videos are a major breach of identity. An example would be Rana Ayub, an investigative journalist and writer. Although Ayub was not a celebrity, she held a job that gave her a platform to speak out against societal beliefs. Ayub was a victim and target of deepfake creators who intended to silence and harass her. Due to the release of framed sexual content, Ayub's image and reputation was tarnished. She was constantly harassed by social on social media by those who saw it. Her story is an example of revenge porn, which is the release of sexually explicit content without consent to cause distress on the victim. Fortunately, some existing solutions have tried to limit deepfakes detriments. Companies like Facebook have created challenges to create innovative tools to detect deepfake, deepfake techniques. The competitive environment stimulates the growth and improvement of deepfake detection tech. Some companies have already developed viable detection software, such as DeepTrace, which scans deepfake media for traces of manipulation using current deepfake technology. Although the technology is able to limit and detect many sources of deepfake media, these technologies cannot be used for the entirety of the internet. Another solution is government intervention. California, Virginia, and Texas have passed state laws that pro prohibit certain deepfake-related activities, and more laws being passed could help regulate deepfakes. 
The biggest limitation here would be that people may use this technology regardless, and the government may not be competent in regulating this technology, something our feasibility survey confirms. People rated their trust in government intervention at only 1.58 out of three on average. To combat these ethical dilemmas, our strategy was to stop the growth of deepfake technology by targeting the source, enact government crackdowns, educate the general public, and censor existing content. Due to the overwhelming cons for allowing the public to use deepfake technology, it would be beneficial for the government and approved companies to release licenses to limit accessibility. Creative licenses, which allow individuals to use deepfake tech, are distributed by companies with software licenses, preventing third-party software development. All licenses have contracts to abstain from production of sexually explicit and defamatory content. Those who breach the contract agreements would have their licenses revoked and would be punished accordingly. We want the government to issue copyright infringements onto individuals who are accessing deepfake technology without a proper license. We also want to implement search and engine restrictions and investigations on popular search sites. For example, searching up results for celebrities is restricted on the Google search engine. We want to incorporate that for potential deepfake porn sites as well. To locate these sites, the government can hold investigations on the most popular search sites. Another important element for our final solution is to provide widespread public education on deepfakes. We want to provide readily available resources about what deepfake is and what it can do to raise public awareness. In order to achieve this, public service announcements and mandatory workshops can be created to advocate for the ethical use of deepfakes and warn the public of the harm it can cause. To censor existing deepfake material, we could use detection software, which has already been in development. Continuing to improve this software could be beneficial. In addition, we could completely illegalize defamatory and non-consensual pornographic videos created out of deepfake technology in all states. Currently, victims can only sue or claim copyright of these videos. To ensure that there is no creation of pornographic material, our solution contains embedded limits within the software. We want to implement an algorithm that can detect pornographic material as well as the faces of politicians within the software. We believe that this is possible to implement since algorithms have been able to detect tumors in the Mayo Clinic in 2018. 48% of those surveyed expressed concerns that we cannot prevent all users from duplicating the software and creating illegal content since the original software will always remain and can be modified for the creator's personal benefits. We ourselves recognize the limitation, but our solution will greatly reduce the spread and redistribution of illegal content and the software. Another limitation would be that the algorithm we want to implement would only protect a limited amount of people, specifically politicians. And lastly, individuals would argue that the use of the software is within their rights. From our survey, 26% responded that they would consider using deep fake technology for their own entertainment or to ruin someone else's career. In conclusion, our solution to implement government regulatory interventions, raise public awareness, and limit accessibility is the best solution to minimize the harm of deepfake technology. Although limitations remain, our solution can greatly reduce the spread and creation of harmful material. Thank you. There are references. Thank you to Team Shallow Reelers, and now judges can have a few minutes for, for questions. I Hi think guys. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Or let me begin by saying that you've chosen something that's uh, very pertinent and you've identified the problem and resourced it very well. Uh, that was great to hear. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a bit more on how you would be um, approaching uh, these public interventions or policy interventions for something that's so important. Uh, because like you rightly mentioned, there are a lot of uh, medical technologies also that, uh, you know, involve these deep fake technologies. And you do not want to limit access to people who would actually be using that. So uh, would you uh, enlist something in your, uh, say, for example, a policy brief, like one of the earlier teams also mentioned uh, or wrote up? Uh, would you have you thought about any anything like that? Any particulars which you would like to uh, particularly push for in your uh, policy intervention? So if you guys could give me your thoughts about that. Um, yeah, definitely. Those are great points. Um, we wanted to really um, elaborate on, or because there's so many like, 
negatives about um, deep fake technology, what we really want to uh, push forward is the medical and um, educational aspects, because definitely being able to like, like you said, like for the medical um, hospitals and stuff, using the, um, the technology to be able to detect tumors and cancers. And also um, in some studies, they were even able to like um, predict whether that person would be like, would have like a higher disposition in developing the, the disease. Those are like great ways to like use deep fake technology and to yeah, veer yeah. off from using it for like pornography because 96% of like the original content like that's on the internet, it's basically pornography and a lot of it can be used to like- It's um, sad to hear, yeah. And that's very eye-opening as well, I must say. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you bringing across that information. Yeah. Thank you too, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions or? Yeah, I'll just take a moment of appreciation to you. It was really a very good topic. Um, I'm also involved in uh, fraud detection of deep fakes. I've been doing that for four or five months. I don't know. Um, so what I did is I, um, you know, identified uh, the uh, documents that are fraudly, you know, uh, provided to some of the organizations or the corporations. So um, out of 100, I got 20 uh, fraud documents and they were just sentenced sentence directly 10 years into the prison without no questions asked. So uh, I must say this is a very um, uh, approachable topic and uh, this has more negative points as positive as everyone is saying. So we should be very careful. We should be very, you know, it's a very normal topic that we should be very careful with the social media and all because just a single image can do very harm and it can be easily converted into a whole working video. So um, just just a, a very good work, keep working on that and uh, um, just keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Wow. Dr. Johnson, do you have any questions? I think the other two judges kind of covered uh, all the all the questions that I had. Um, but this was a wonderful presentation. I mean, this is a really noble undertaking. So, so good job on the choice of topic. Thank you so much. Charlie Wheelers, um, and next we'll welcome Team Nourishment. So I'll get the timer ready and your team may begin now. Hi everyone, I'm Alexis. I'm Faith. I'm Shruti. I'm Zano. And we're Team Nourishment. Today we're going to be addressing the second prompt under public health for the 18 to 22 age category. So what if the future of medicine is not drugs, vaccines, or procedures, but a healthy diet? And what if the key to preventing neurological disease lies not in antibiotics, but tiny intestinal flora? Today we will cover nutritional neuroscience, Alzheimer's disease, and the critical yet largely unknown link between the two that could revolutionize healthcare as we know it. You will also be introduced to the Nourishment app we created to address the lack of awareness about brain health among young adults. So most of us associate the phrase, you are what you eat, with our parents trying to force us to eat vegetables when we were young. However, modern science tells us that this is more true than you realize. Our diets and food additives affect neurobiology, neurochemistry, behavior, and performance. And the gut plays such a vital role in our physical and psychological health that it actually holds the nickname, the second brain. Eating food that empowers a diverse microbiome can actually change our brain chemistry and impact our risk for certain neurodegenerative disorders. There are currently 10 times the amount of microbial cells in the body than eukaryotic cells, meaning we are more bacteria than human. This wide diversity of microbiota creates a healthy balance in the body. However, if somebody with a healthy gut begins to eat foods only high in fat, like ice cream or pizza, the microbes that digest oils and bread will outcompete the ones that digest vegetables or meat, leaving a skewed ratio as depicted by the picture on the right. This skewed ratio affects mental health, memory, and cognitive thinking, much like the natural process of aging. The gut-brain axis is a two-way communication between the gastrointestinal tract and the CNS through biochemical signaling, and the vagus nerve is an information superhighway that connects the ENS to the CNS. And there are four possible pathways, immune cells, neuroactive molecules, metabolites, and pre-existing brain bacteria, according to recent research. Our brain is structured to keep substances out via tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier. Unfortunately, this barrier is so effective that it often prevents life-saving drugs from being able to repair a diseased brain. And that's where the gut microbiome steps in. 
Some microbes are small enough to cross the BBB, while others release molecules, making it more or less permeable to outside substances, enabling two-way communication. And much like the mutualistic relationship between the mitochondria and the cell, the brain and gut need each other to survive. In one study on mice, researchers added an aggressive cage mate to a mouse's environment, which increased the initial mouse's stress, increasing some microbes and decreasing others. And in another study, when researchers separately raised germ-free mice and mice colonized with natural microbes, the germ-free mice had lower levels of BDNF, a protein important for learning, memory, and higher order thinking. As you can see, both studies show the critical crosstalk between the ENS and the CNS. Alzheimer's, a progressive neurodegenerative disease, involves the loss of neurons and their connections. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services predicts the number of 80 cases to reach approximately 107 million in just 30 years from now. Research has shown that malnutrition leads to rapid cognitive decline, so maintaining a healthy diet is very important in keeping both our bodies and our brains healthy. Food-derived signals actually influence our energy metabolism, and mood through neuronal function and synaptic plasticity. Our gut hormones influence the way we think. For instance, poor diets, high in saturated fat, reduce molecular substrates, important for cognition, which increases our risk of neurological dysfunction. Here's a fun fact. Often nicknamed the happy brain chemical, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that helps mediate our moods. What's fascinating is that 95% of the serotonin in our bodies is produced in our gastrointestinal tract, lined with 100 million neurons. Foods related to these areas contain nutrients that eat away brain plaque and improve neuron structure by building membranes and around, around brain cells and diminish cognitive decline. The translation of scientific research into public health actions is extremely necessary. Because there's a lack of awareness surrounding nutritional neuroscience among younger adults, greater public health awareness measures are crucial in promoting brain health awareness to increase early prevention efforts of Alzheimer's and similar neurodegenerative diseases. From a randomized study of 103 participants, 80% of our respondents have never seen a nutritionist and 70% of our respondents eat food solely for taste rather than brain health. With that said, we introduce you to the Nourishment app, Better Nutrition, Better Cognition. Most brain health apps only offer cognitive challenge games or are geared towards older adults experiencing dementia. They also don't offer nutritional advice specific to brain health. Ind because individuals can experience Alzheimer's symptoms as early as the age of 30, our app aims to improve brain health awareness in younger adults. So based on our survey results, 80% of the respondents said that they would like to use a nutrition app to network and learn about brain health. 63% of the respondents would commit to a nutrition plan with an accountability partner or group. And 80% would like to chat with nutrition experts as well. In our app, we offer brain nutrition information, diet plans, recipes, and consultation services from volunteer telenutritionists. We also include the ability to track brain nutrient intake and a positive reinforcement reward system. Additionally, our diets make a huge difference in our risk of cognitive decline and dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Certain foods we eat can diminish brain aging by 7.5 years and decrease our risk of Alzheimer's. Nourishment also encourages cross-cultural learning and reduces barriers by including people from different cultural, culinary, and linguistic backgrounds. For instance, one can view their app in the Spanish language and discover the neurological benefits of what is typically on a Mediterranean meal plate. Most young adults are not aware of how important it is to act now in preventing future neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Also, social interaction can improve one's mental health. And as social networking is very popular among young, younger adults, our app will allow them to stay connected via food. Users can create health packs and media chat with friends to stay motivated. Our app can also be promoted in educational settings to increase brain health and nutrition awareness. When so many of us make the effort to nourish our body, why not do the same to nourish our brain? After all, better nutrition is better cognition. Thank you all so much for your time and the opportunity to present. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. I'd really like to ask you guys, what is it that you guys ate and came for this presentation? <laughs> because that was like a great energy out there and good teamwork. And it's a great note to end this uh, round of, uh, you know, presentation on. Just my thoughts. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
think some of us actually had a smoothie right before this. So that's just like, ah, oh. that. Oh. <laughs> and she has stopped on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Good work, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, again, a very good work. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to complete uh, this 10 round of uh, presentation with a smile. So keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I also don't have any questions because I think that was really well presented. Um, I just want to say I'm so I'm so pleased that research is is focusing on the enteric nervous system because feeding is kind of my first my first home in science. So I'm I think this is a, a wonderful idea. Oh, we're so fun. grateful you think that way. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we definitely wanted to find a way to actually translate um, all the research that's going on in the nutritional neuroscience field and coming up with the public action that's accessible to so many groups and different populations. So thank you. Thank you. Do the judges have any other questions for this group? Uh, seeing none, does the audience have any questions? Well, um, thank you, Nourishment, for your excellent presentation. And that comes to an end of our top 10 presentations for the International Youth Brain Stem Summit. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you to everybody for attending and to our top 10 finalists for presenting. So I really hope that all of you learned something about the experience, both from your own work and from watching these presentations.